Good evening. Welcome to the Zacharias Institute for the second event of our ongoing series, Trending Questions. I don't know if you guys have picked up on this, but right about now, our culture is very confused about a lot of questions out there. And in this series, we aim to bring biblical clarity to some of the common cultural questions. If you missed the first event that we had in October, it was John Lennox was speaking on Should We Fear Artificial Intelligence? You can feel free to view that online if you'd like. And our next trending question will be um, handled by our very own Ravi Zacharias speaking to a question surrounding human value. So be on the lookout for that as well. Two weeks ago, I was at the University of Florida, and I was speaking with a PhD student um, after one of the talks there, after we interacted on the Q&A, and we spoke for about an hour. And um, after the day, next day, he agreed to meet me and receive a book that I wanted to give to him as a gift. And when he did, he, he said um, he, he has a different worldview. We talked over some very difficult topics, um, questions going in both directions. And as we did, as we talked the second day, he said, you know, I was reflecting on our conversation yesterday. And it's sad to me that more people don't know about Christians like you guys. I don't say that to pat ourselves on the back, um, but I do say that to say that there is a conversation that people want to have about these big questions. Um, truth was stated without wavering, but love and compassion were also boldly proclaimed in the way our team interacted with people. His questions, I think this is one of the things that really stood out, his questions were taken seriously. And not only that, he was taken seriously as he was asked some very difficult questions back, and we wrestled together. For those of you who are familiar with RZIM, you know that we really love to engage with people's questions. Um, however, we don't do this just because it's interesting to fill our heads with more information, and we don't do this just to show people that there are thoughtful answers to their questions, although there are. The reason we value people's questions is because, because we value people. People, when they share their questions, are giving us an invitation into relationship with them. And so when we trade questions with people, we are engaging in a relationship. And as Ravi Zacharias notably has said, behind every question, there's a questioner. A person who is created in the image of God and therefore has value and dignity and should be treated with respect. I say all of this as we start tonight's event because we are engaging with a very personal and sensitive topic. The trending question we'll be hearing about tonight is how can I know my gender? Now for some people, this topic may seem like a very simple question. But for many people, maybe some even in this room tonight, this question is not a simple one. A lot of us in our lives have that one question that we maybe rethink and reread about and continue to, to, um, to just think and wrestle over. And this question is usually informed by our personal experience. For those who wrestle with sexual identity or love someone who does, tonight's question is that question. So it needs to be taken seriously, and it also needs to be dealt with with great care. And for any topic that needs a lot of care, I know that our speaker tonight is up for that task because he truly has the heart of a pastor, and he has a deep love for people. Now, I say this, even though the last time he taught, he basically called me a dumb sheep, but that's okay. Um, he got it from the Bible, and it was right, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you that, Sam. <laughs> Sam Albury is our speaker tonight, and he's a member of RZIM's global speaking team. He's a writer and editor for the Gospel Coalition, an author of a number of books, including Why Bother with Church, James for You, a 90-day devotional book he co-wrote with Tim Keller. His best-selling book is God Anti-Gay, and his latest book, due to be released on, May oh, sorry, on the 28th of this month, Seven Myths About Singleness. Now, for those of you now, sorry to those of you online, but in-house, we got pre-release copies, so the only place you can get it today is in our bookstore, if you want that, and all of those um, books I mentioned are in the bookstore. You'll notice out in the atrium here, displayed on the wall, is the tagline for the Zacharias Institute, which says this. It says, the questions of culture, the invitation of Christ. Sam is asked to speak about sexual, sexuality and identity a lot around the globe. And I was once traveling back from a retreat with Sam, and I asked him, 
You, you speak about these topics a, a lot. Do you, do you ever get tired of doing it? And I love what he said. His response was, no, because every, every time I get to talk about Jesus. The questions of culture, the invitation of Christ. Sam really does an excellent job of capturing this mission that we seek to live by here at the Zacharias Institute, which is why it's always a special treat to have Sam with us. So can you guys please give Sam a warm welcome as he comes to join us on stage. Well, thanks for joining us tonight, Sam. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's always good to be with you. Um, we just have a, a short time here, so I want to dive right in and have, have our audience um, online and here get to know you. And I want to take a little bit of a unique approach in the interview tonight. You've written several books, more than what I even listed there. And um, anytime someone ventures out on the endeavor of writing a book, it's not an easy job. I mean, I've not done it myself, but I've heard, so I've heard. And um, there has to be some driving force behind that. And so what I'd love to do is actually use three of your books as a little bit of a lens for us to get to know you through tonight. And so I, as, we, as we do that, I want people to get to know this driving forces behind some of these books, because I think they all cover different areas um, that help us get to know you. So the one I'd like to start with is uh, Why Bother with Church? Can you tell us a little bit about your background in the church, uh, your, your personal background, what motivated this book? and maybe where you're from, because you do sound a little bit different than I do. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. I'm from the UK. Um, uh, grew up just um, outside London in one direction. Now live just outside London in a slightly different direction, so I've not moved terribly far. Um, I've been, I became a Christian when I turned 18. I wasn't raised going to church. I didn't really have much interest in Christian things as a child. Um, but I, be, I was presented with the claims of, of Jesus when I was 18. I immediately realized that Jesus was less easy and far more compelling than I'd imagined him to be. I felt very intrigued by what he had to say, became a, a follower of him, and quickly became involved in church life and uh, was involved in local church pastoral ministry for, for a good number of years before joining the team here. So the church, the local church, has been, been on my heart for, for many years. And it was my job to go to church. So in one sense, I never really had to sort of think through the question of should I go to church this week or not, because I'd get fired if I didn't. So it was a fairly straightforward kind <laughs> of issue. Easy decision. <laughs> but, um, you know, I recognise that we, we tend to be increasingly a, a commitment-phobic kind of society. We don't like being kind of pinned down to particular obligations like that. So I wanted to write something very short that would capture the place of, of the local church in the life of a Christian and to show how God has designed us as believers not to be able to flourish alone. We need the input and the encouragement of a, of a Christian body around us. And most significantly, why, why bother with church? The answer really is because Jesus does. And if we want to follow Jesus, we need to have the same regard and attitude to the local church that we see that he does. And the local church is not some little project that Jesus goes out and works on on Saturday afternoons in his garage. He refers to the church as his beloved, as his bride. And... You're married. I don't think I would get very far in friendship with you if I kept saying negative things about your bride, I'm mm -hmm. guessing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. think we're going to get very we'd far. Have, we'd, have, we'd have some more time. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and simply, we're not, we're not going to get very far with Jesus if, if we keep neglecting to, to think well of his bride. So that was mm. really the heart behind that, that little book. And it, just trying to deal with... Some of the big questions that people have about church, you know, what, what do I do if my church has hurt me? We're very conscious, even this week, um, of abuses that have, have been going on in the local church. So trying to be honest about the failings of the church as well, which are, are even more glaring when we see the high calling the church is, is given by Jesus. Well said. I know that when I became um, a Christian, I had those questions. Well, why, why do we do this? 
Why do I have to do this? And then it was actually during some prayer meetings for me where I was, I'm, I'm continually struck by the fact that we can gather together and pray for each other. And that, it seems very simple to people in the culture. Well, don't, don't pray, do something about whatever the issue may be. And I, that's actually been one of the things as a Christian that has really struck me is this, is this community, this doing life together. It's not that we have to, we really get to. Yeah. Um, well, thanks. And so then let's turn a little bit to your second, the second book that I want to talk about, which is one of your best-selling books, Is God Anti-Gay? And this one for me has personally been a huge help in addressing uh, this questions about same-sex attraction and what does the Bible have to say about it. Um, it's actually probably the one we give away most when we go on a university campus for these week-long uh, missions because this, everyone's asking this question. It is very much needed. So first, thank you for writing it and taking the time to do that and wrestling through that. But then also, what, what really motivated you um, to write this topic and how have you found people responding? Thank you. Um, what, what drove me with this one was very much, well, again, similarly, similar to the, 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 the book on church, uh, a lot of it was driven by personal experience. And with, in the case of, of homosexuality, this has been part of my own story, um, part of my own experience for, for many years. And so it's an issue I've had to come to terms with in my own life. I've had to think through, as a, as a Christian believer, what does the Bible really say on these issues, where, where does Jesus stand? Is Jesus good news for people in my kind of situation? So very much driven by my own personal kind of journey with Christ and, and with human sexuality and feeling a, an increasing burden. For, for many years, I was adamant that I was never going to speak publicly about my own kind of journey with human sexuality. I didn't want to be that guy. Mm -hmm. um, but just felt an increasing burden as, as our culture became more confused and confusing around these issues, that we needed some voices who could address the issue of, of human sexuality from the inside of it. And all I really wanted to say was that the words of Jesus to someone like me are good words, uh, words that we can commend. The gospel is good news. It's never a bad deal to follow Jesus, whoever you are. It's never an easy deal but it's always an amazing deal. So that, that book was kind of born out of very much those kind of personal wrestlings and, and engagements as well. Well, although you said you would never speak on it, you find yourself speaking on it a lot. Again, thank, thank you for, for taking the time to do that. And it emboldens us and really teaches us um, more than just information. It gives us actually a tone well, in which to speak, it about, uh, to, speak to the topic about. Great. Well, the, the last book, and we don't have a whole lot more time, but the last book here I want to ask is the one that is due to release at the end of the month, Seven Myths About Singleness. Um, I mean, as I talk with people, this is a topic that needs to be written about. It seems like you're always really picking those topics that a lot of people are wrestling with. I, I, I love that. Um, but w again, for this book, what was, the, what was really the driving force for you? How, how have you personally... Um, Invest, invested in this topic? Well, I, I am single. I've, I've always been single. Um, and I'm not expecting that to, to change in the future either. So again, it's coming out of very much a personal experience. Um, I, I seem to be wrestling with the very things that our, our culture wrestles with. I'm, I'm no different really in that respect to, to anybody else. So really, it's just trying to think through what, what, what does the Bible say about singleness? Our, our culture tends to think that Singleness is amazing if by singleness we mean you've got freedom to play the field. And I remember when I was 18, I, was, I went to a, a, a local pub with a couple of friends of mine and this, this old guy was sat at the bar and started chatting to us as we were getting our drinks. And he said, all of us were 18, we were just about to kind of head off to university. And uh, he said, let me give you one piece of advice, guys. Drink as much as you can and get your leg over as far as possible. And we were like, uh, okay. Um, slightly odd thing for a random old guy to, to say to a group of young guys. But that was, that was his attitude, and that's the attitude of many people. Just if you're, if you're single, that means you are unconstrained and you have sexual freedom, so make the most of it. Mm. Now, the Bible has a very different take on this because the, the Bible teaches, Jesus teaches, that sex is something God has invented, designed, given to us as a gift for a very particular context. 
And so for the Christian, being single means not just being unmarried, but being sexually abstinent, mm. uh, being celibate is the, is the old word for it. We only have old words for this category because we don't have any contemporary concept of it. Uh, so you end up sounding like you're someone from Downton Abbey every time you <laughs> talk about this, this issue for that reason. Um, but it means a lot of people would look at Christian singleness and think that's really either weird or probably bad for you to be kind of sexually inactive. Um, that's very repressive, that's very harmful. And in many of our churches, sadly, it is not easy to be single. Much of church life is, is built on the assumption that people are within nuclear families and that's the basic unit of, of, of church life. So my aim really with the book is, is to help all of us understand more what the Bible actually says about singleness and, and how valuable a gift it is from God, how useful a gift it is for God, from God. It's, it's designed to be a way of serving and blessing other people. And I hope that will just slowly change the culture in our churches that actually a life of long-term singleness won't feel like it's a kind of sentence, that it's a kind of, well, you're just going to have to be on your own for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Because if we're doing church the way the Bible says we should do church, if we are esteeming and honouring singleness the, Bible, the way that the Bible does, then actually churches should be wonderful places to be single. Yeah, well said. I think that's one thing I love about, as we've talked about this topic and about your book, is that I feel like as a married man and my wife's married woman, we need to actually read this and engage with it just, just as much because it, it impacts how we live in community. That first, that first thing we were talking about, what does it mean to do church, to be the church together? So, um, yeah. I'm not wanting to, to sound too morbid, but over half of the people who are married are going to be single again. So it's easy to think, well, I'm married now, so I'm done with singleness, don't need to think about that yeah. anymore. That's not the case. Yeah, yeah, well said. All right, well, we want to get into um, the content of the evening for your talk. So we're going to pop up right here. They're going to reset the stage. And while they, while they do, I just want to um, tell you guys about how the Q&A time is going to work. If you have your, a mobile device, you go to pigeonhole.at pigeonhole.at, and there will be, it'll ask for a passcode. The passcode is trending. Again, that's tr trending, so think trending questions. And uh, you can submit all of your questions uh, through there, and it's an online interactive format where you can vote on other people's questions, and they, you, can, you can enter your own questions, and you also vote on other people's questions. So feel free to go to pigeonhole.at and enter your question and vote on other questions. Uh, the other thing I wanted to make sure you guys know about is RZM Connect is our online community where you can go and if you're online right now, watching online, you can interact around this and the conversation will continue after this event. So RZM Connect, you go there, create an account, and then you, you go in. It's our, our, our community where people go for questions, personal answers to big questions of faith. So feel free to go there. And the last thing I said earlier to some of us, um, if you're watching online, feel free to share this. Hashtag trending questions. If you make any comments online, we'd love you to use that hashtag. And that is it for now. So Sam, go for it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for, for coming to this event. And for those of you who are watching online, thank you very much for, for tuning in and for, for watching. Thank you for caring about this issue. Uh, it's not an issue we can avoid in our culture today, but it is an issue some people might think, well, I don't need to think about this. It doesn't concern me personally, perhaps, and therefore I'm just going to ignore it. But actually, we should care about this because we're talking about uh, people. Um, it was late in 2015 when the magazine Vanity Fair featured on its cover the former Olympic champion Bruce Jenner. Jenner was now identifying as a woman and prov uh, posing provocatively under the caption, Call Me Caitlin. Uh, Jenna had been defining as transgender for some time, and now the journey from, from Bruce to Caitlin was complete. And it was a moment that signaled perhaps more than any other uh, thing that was going on that the transgender revolution really had arrived. Many people on, on all sides of the discussion were referring to this as the transgender moment. Uh, this way of thinking, this 
phenomenon was now suddenly becoming mainstream. Uh, Jenna became very quickly one of the most famous transgender people in the world. There were a slew of interviews, television appearances, uh, even a reality TV show that came off the back of that magazine cover. And Jenna just became one of, of many um, well-known, high-profile transgender people to kind of grab our collective attention. So no one can deny, and, and interestingly, 2015 feels, actually it feels like ancient history now. Um, so much has happened even since then. It's hard to imagine a time, even four years ago, when the issue of transgenderism and gender Id identity wasn't at the front and centre of our public consciousness. So much has changed in how we think about gender. Older, more traditional um, cultures and societies had always said that your gender is determined by the obje objective fact of your biological sex. Now, however, we were being encouraged to think that the objective facts of biology do not determine your gender identity. It's your subjective perception that matters. So one prominent cha um, transgender uh, personality, Chaz Bono, said that gender is not about what's between your legs, but about what's between your ears. In other words, gender is not to do with your genitalia, it's to do with your mind. It's to do with your experience, it's to do with your perception. It's not your biology, but your psychology that is significant and determining. Now, before we go on, it's useful just to, to define some of the terms that we are thinking about this evening. The word transgender simply describes those for whom their gender identity doesn't match and the language they would want to, to, to use does not match the biological sex they were assigned at birth. Uh, that very terminology itself reflects some of the changes we've seen in recent years. Uh, many who um, identify as transgender experience what's known as gender dysphoria. Uh, the word dysphoria is the opposite of euphoria. If euphoria is a profoundly positive feeling and experience, dysphoria is a profound unease. Gender dysphoria is the experience of feeling as though your psychological, your emotional gender identity may differ from your biological appearance. There feels like there's some kind of mismatch between your body and who you actually feel yourself to be. Uh, so when we're talking about transgenderism, we are talking about something very different, uh, for example, to homosexuality. Uh, there is some overlap. Both are forms of, of sexual identity. Both are part of the, that continuum of, of letters that we're becoming more and more familiar with, LGBTQ+, and so on. But as has often been described, the best way of, of distinguishing between these different issues is to say that sexual orientation is about who you want to go to bed with. Gender identity is about who you want to go to bed as. It's not about who you're attracted to, but who you believe yourself to be. Now these changes have had a massive impact on Western culture. Uh, there has been enormous social, medical, political and legislative change, even in the last two or three years. The prevailing wisdom of our, our culture is that if you feel yourself to be a man deep down inside, then that is what you are. If you feel yourself to be a woman deep down inside, then that is what you are. And if you feel yourself to be none of the above or something entirely different, then that is what you are. Not only do we make this an internalized experience, but we, we reject any notion that there's only two options out there. And so this has become such an important issue because our, our belief as a culture is that you can't truly flourish as you unless you embrace that inner identity. The way for you to be authentically, fully you is to determine who you are deep down inside and then to live out that identity. 
Uh, that, by the way, is, has been the, the message, I think, of pretty much every Disney movie in the last 10 or 15 years. You have to be true to yourself. And if other people don't celebrate that, that's their problem and not yours. And if it's used as a way of constraining or denying someone's identity, then biology is bigotry, to quote one activist. And so it's, it's become a, an issue of justice in our own time. Uh, it is for the wider community to accept and celebrate someone's gender identity. It's a civil right. It's, it's seen as being equivalent to, to race. It's a matter of equality. And so this has had far-reaching implications and all kinds of discussions that are continuing to, to rumble on around us uh, when it comes to restrooms and who is most appropriately allowed access to which restrooms. Um, issues like school uniforms, whether they should be based on someone's biological appearance or based on someone's gender identity. Should we have two different uniforms anyway? Uh, what about eligibility for competing in certain sporting events? If you identify as a, as a woman, should you be allowed to compete in a women's sporting event if you are biologically regarded as male. Uh, this has come very close to home for, for many churches as well. Uh, the youth group are going away on a, on a retreat or a camp. Uh, people are encouraged to invite their friends along. Um, someone comes along and says, well, I, I identify as a boy, and so I want to be given accommodation with the boys. What is the church to do? So this issue, for, for many people, will feel like it's, it's been thrust upon us very, very abruptly. Uh, when it came to issues of, of same-sex relationships and same-sex marriage, it kind of felt like there was a, a longer run-in. We'd been kind of wrestling with these things over a longer period of time, but for issues of transgenderism and gender identity, it feels like this has all suddenly arrived in, in one go. And many believers, especially, are, are kind of still trying to catch up and trying to, to keep up with what is going on around them. So let me just say, for the benefit of, of Christians in the room, three very quick ways Christians shouldn't respond to the issue of transgenderism. The first one is we can't avoid it. I think you know that. That's why you're here anyway. So I'm preaching to the, to the choir on that point. Secondly, we mustn't dismiss this. Uh, a number of Christians would say that even... Addressing the question we're addressing tonight in the form that we've posed it is inappropriate. Uh, that somehow we're, we're already capitulating to the spirit of the age, even by raising this question. It's just, well, it's so obvious we shouldn't have to ask it. But in almost every single instance, we're talking about people who are made in the image of God who are precious to him and who in virtually every single instance are experiencing some kind of acute pain. That alone, if we call ourselves Christians, should pique not only our interest but our care. If our response to the issue of transgenderism is frustration, I suspect it may be a sign that we're not regarding the culture around us with the same perspective as Christ would. However much we may take issue with some of the, the thinking going on in the world around us, the pain being experienced is very, very real indeed. And finally, Christians shouldn't panic. It's very easy for, for Christians when there's a sudden kind of swing in culture to feel very overwhelmed by that. But for those of us who are Christians, actually the, the big ticket realities of this life have not changed. God is still reigning. The gospel is still true. People are still needy. The spirit is still active. The kingdom is still coming. Whatever else has changed around us, people are still people and God is still God. And good news is still wonderfully good news. 
So given where we are then as a culture, how should we think and respond to some of these issues being raised around us? I want to suggest there are two or three aspects of this whole discussion that we need to give very careful thought to, whether we would call ourselves Christians or not. There is thinking that needs to be done. Uh, many of us just kind of respond with, it, with an intuition of, well, this is self-evidently right or self-evidently wrong. Actually, we need to think. We need to think very carefully. These are such important issues. This is not going to be resolved on Twitter. So we need to think, firstly, about gender. Uh, this is a matter of ongoing discussion in the world around us. Even in the world around us that would call itself secular, there is still a huge amount of discussion going on regarding gender. For some people following historic feminism, gender is entirely socially constructed. There's a biological givenness to us. We are bodily male or bodily female, and gender is simply the social expression of that biological reality and the thesis of many feminists over the years has been that that biological distinction has been the basis for sex-based oppression. But fundamental to that way of thinking is the assumption that our primary gender identity is driven by our bodies. And that gender itself is a social construct that we are required to deconstruct. Uh, for many other people, uh, perhaps following the, the more kind of transgender way of thinking, the givenness is not our biological self, the givenness is our inner gender identity. That is the piece that is innate and immutable. Biology itself is simply arbitrary. So there's a tension here, even within the secular world. On one hand, some would say being a woman means not conforming to certain gender stereotypes. And yet, on the other hand, the image on the cover of Vanity Fair seemed to suggest the exact opposite. What proves Jenna's womanhood is those very stereotypes themselves. Uh, this tension has led to feminists like Germaine Greer asserting that it's impossible for someone like Jenna to truly enter into full womanhood because Jenna has not lived with female, bi female biology and experienced puberty as a biological female. In response to that kind of assertion, Jermaine Greer has been deplatformed by various secular institutions, the kind of institutions she was so fundamental in helping to give birth to in the first place. So on one hand, feminists are saying that actually women have been victims of sex-based oppression and yet at the same time transgender ideologists are saying there is no such thing as biological sex. Even within the transgender uh, discussions and community, there is disagreement about whether or not we should make a distinction between transgender and non-transgender men or women. Uh, just last week in the London Times, a transgender woman was ordered to delete tweets saying that transgender women are not the same as biological women. She was saying she felt that even as a transgender woman, that there was a distinction there that needs to be upheld. And she was ordered by Twitter to take down those tweets as being offensive. There's also some tension in the wider LGBT world between the LGB and the T. Uh, the gay rights activist and social commentator Andrew Sullivan wrote a piece just a couple of weeks ago questioning aspects of this transgender ideology. If, say, a transgender woman is attracted to women, are they really a lesbian? Some within the gay community would say not. They would say that irrespective of how that person identifies, Someone with a penis being attracted to someone with a vagina cannot be a lesbian. Others in the transgender community very strenuously disagree because biology here is irrelevant. 
So even within the secular world, there is not one view. There is much that is being contested. Some people seem to sense that our, our biology surely is meaningful. It does mean something. It does say something about who we are. That our experience of being male or female, of going through puberty, has, has some bearing on what makes us us. Whereas others are saying that actually, no, it's, it's the non-biological essence of being male or female that is, is most meaningful. It's not just about anatomy, it's about something more innate and deep within us. Well, I want to suggest that the Bible makes sense of both of these intuitions and it also challenges us at various points as well. I've got a couple of verses up um, from the Bible. The first is perhaps well known to, to many Christians. It's from Genesis 1, verse 27. And it's the account of God creating uh, the first human beings. We read in Genesis 1, verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Now notice what this verse says about gender identity. It says firstly that gender identity is embodied. Our maleness and femaleness, according to Genesis 1, are physically grounded, not merely psychologically determined. So in the account of the creation of Adam in Genesis 2, God didn't create a non-physical self called Adam and then look for a body to put Adam into. Instead, God fashioned out of the ground a male body, which he then brought to life and named Adam. Adam's maleness is physically grounded, not merely psychologically determined. Uh, notice, furthermore, that gender identity, according to Genesis 1, is, is foundational. It's foundational to what it means to be a, an image bearer of God. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. Now, human beings, this is not breaking news, are not the only creatures to be male and female. But we are the only creatures in the Bible whose maleness and femaleness has this kind of significance. Because it takes us to the heart of what it means to be image bearers of God. Which leads to the, the next observation on Genesis 1, which is that our gender identity is binary. Genesis 1 describes God creating male and female, two sexes. Not a spectrum, but a binary. And again, as, as that account of creation itself anticipates, that binary becomes hugely significant in the storyline of the Bible because it becomes caught up with another binary in Genesis 1, which is heaven and earth. And the union of, of male and female becomes a picture, a signpost of the eventual union of heaven and earth that will occur through the work of Jesus Christ. Just as the man and the woman in Genesis 2 are made for each other, that they belong together, so too heaven and earth are made for each other and belong together. But we also see in the Bible's account of things that our, our maleness and femaleness is not just about biology. This biological givenness actually represents something of a calling. And it is meant to lead to some other, more generalized differences between men and women. In the words of, of one Christian writer, male and female, men and women, each have a unique and non-interchangeable glory that the other does not. Each is able to see things and, and do things in slightly different ways, but in such a way that we need each other. And there is the significance of Genesis 1. We cannot adequately image God as only men and only women. We need the mixing of the two. Each needs the other. 
And I want to suggest that, again, we sense this in our world today. If Just imagine there was somehow, somewhere, a small town out in the middle of nowhere that was only populated by men. Or another small town somewhere else out in the middle of nowhere that was somehow only populated by women. We might, if we, if we kind of encountered that, make some sort of jokes about the perceived foibles of, of men or women. But there would be an underlying serious point. We, we just instinctively recognize that such a community would not be healthy. And we're not just talking about the, the kind of effects on the reproductive potential of such a community. Actually, something deeper than that would be lacking. We sense that we need each other as men and women. It is not the case that there is nothing a woman could bring to a male-only context that another man couldn't bring. We may not be able to put our finger on precisely what it is, but there is something different about masculinity and femininity that makes each precious and valuable in its own way. I want to suggest that observation, controversial though it is, is good news. It's good news because if that is not the case, if we are merely interchangeable as male and female, it will be the the sex that is generally physically weaker that will suffer. Unless each has its own intrinsic value and worth, unless each has something that the other needs, one will dominate the other. Well, as the Bible goes on, it describes the the distortion of our humanity as collectively we turn away from God, and that disrupts everything. Uh, It complicates our perception and our experience of being male and female, but it doesn't obliterate that distinction. So, Genesis 5, after the fall of humanity, after this distortion and disruption, reaffirms something we see in Genesis 1, verse 27. It says in Genesis 5, 1 and 2, that when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God, male and female, he created them and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. They are still male and female. No longer doing a very good job of being male and female, no longer fully understanding what that should mean or how to respond to and value the other, but still nevertheless male and female. Uh, Jesus himself reaffirms that binary distinction and identity. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is responding to uh, some Pharisees who are presenting him with a question. He says to them in Matthew 19 verse 4, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Jesus reiterates the existence of this male-female distinction. He says it's an ongoing reality that, that still means something, however distorted our understanding and experience of it might be. So how do I know my gender? Well, Genesis 1 says it is biologically grounded and carries with it something of a calling. But the rest of the Bible shows us our capacity to understand that is now severely hampered. And therefore, as well as thinking about gender, we need secondly to think about our bodies. And there is, I want to suggest, a a vital insight that the Bible gives us on this. In uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 20, Paul writes these words. He says the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Dense sentence of Paul. If you read the letter to the Romans, it's made of very dense 
crowded sentences like that, but Paul is basically saying the physical world just it isn't quite right. It's kind of been busted up. It's been, he called, subjected to futility. It's, it's frustrated. It doesn't work properly. It's out of joint. And it's been subjected to this frustration by God himself as a kind of wake-up call. Creation isn't right, Paul is saying, as a kind of ongoing reminder to us that as people, we're not right. And what is true of creation in general is, is also true of our bodies. They too have been made subject to the same frustration. They too do not work properly. Uh, we see this in a, in a variety of ways. There are, for many of us, serious and unremitting health issues. I'm not going to do a survey of, of this room to see how many of us have taken medication today, but it will be very, very many of us. We have a, a retirees group at our, our church back home. I was speaking at it recently. I've learned now not to, to sort of say to this group, how are you? <laughs> I'll, I'll have to immediately cancel dinner plans and, and kind of make alternative arrangements. Our bodies are not always on our side when it comes to this. One dear friend of mine who has had really chronic, debilitating health issues said to me once that she, when she reads the Psalms that talk about our enemies, she often thinks of her body because of the pain it's, it's caused her over the years. Uh, we see that same frustration with our bodies, with the whole range of, of body image struggles that so many of us today experience. I was talking with the, the youth worker at, at my church recently. He was telling me just how many teenage boys are coming up to him and, and sharing some kind of issue to do with an eating disorder or some body image problem. And those are just the ones who were are saying it to him. And there are those, as we've mentioned, who experience some kind of body dysphoria, feeling trapped in the wrong kind of body. So none of us has an entirely straightforward relationship with our body. Uh, all of us are, are out of sync with God, we're out of sync with each other, we're out of sync with creation, but we're, we're out of sync even with ourselves. And so it shouldn't surprise Christians, of all people, that someone could feel so out of sorts with their own body. In fact, the, the teaching of Jesus reflects an awareness of this. That passage we just flagged up earlier where Jesus says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? In the very same passage, Jesus then goes on to say, For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth. So Jesus is saying at the same time, God has made us male and female, and some are born eunuchs. Uh, eunuchs were people in the time of Jesus who, who, who didn't marry, either because they chose not to, or because of something that had been done to them, or because some of them were born as eunuchs. Maybe born with some kind of anatomical anomaly that would make it physically impossible for them to marry. So Jesus is highlighting that our experience of being male and female is not always straightforward. There will be those who find this particular aspect of physical life especially painful and confusing. And by saying there are some who have been eunuchs from birth, Jesus is saying to those who are wrestling with those kinds of pains and confusions, that he gets it. He sees it. He expects that to be the case in a world like this. That God made us male and female doesn't mean there's no complication, no difficulty, no hurt, no confusion. But nor does the presence of that complexity mean that God hasn't made us male and female. 
Many today would say that the presence of, of people who are, are intersex, people whose body at birth doesn't seem to fit neatly into either male or female, many people would say the existence of intersex people shows us there is no such thing as male and female. But that would be like saying that the existence of someone who is colorblind means there is no such thing as red and green. Um, I had a slightly more eventful drive here um, today than I had wanted. I was borrowing a, a friend's car. They were very kind to lend it to me. They either did not know or neglected to say that if you press slightly too hard on the gas pedal, it sticks. So I drove onto the interstate. They had someone impatient behind me, so I thought, I'll just get on the interstate and then put the foot down and get out of their way. I put my foot down and did get out of their way and then couldn't slow down. And was just beginning to sort of wonder how I was going to communicate to the office that I might not be here tonight, whilst also trying to remember the plot of that Sandra Bullock movie with the bus and to try and think, how did she manage to resolve this for herself? When I realised if he just kind of kept stamping on the thing, eventually it kind of unstuck. And I then drove very, very gingerly and only very gently accelerated for the rest of the journey. If you were part of the tailback behind me, then I apologise to you. What would have made that journey in even more dangerous would have been if I had decided that the, the, the presence of people who are colorblind meant that I'm now going to abandon any distinction between red and green. That distinction is quite significant. We abandon it at our own peril. And the same is true of male and female. And yet, as Jesus acknowledges, some are born eunuchs. Some wrestle with their gender identity. Some feel as though their, their body is telling a different story to who they believe themselves to be. And Christians, because of what we're being taught in passages like Romans 8, we have a unique way of accounting for these experiences, which should mean that Christians, of all people, are naturally the most compassionate on these issues. We may not know someone else's particular experience, and we shouldn't presume to. The occasions when I've been privileged to spend time with uh, transgender individuals, my, my typical question is, has been, listen, if you... If you feel comfortable sharing, I'd just love to know more about what it's been like for you being you. It's important to hear the stories, to understand the ups and downs. And whilst I'm never going to say, oh, well, I know how you feel, I do know what it's like to live in a broken world. And so even if I don't know how that person feels, I can understand how they've come to feel that way. And final point is we, we really do need to think very, very carefully about how much we should trust our perception of ourselves. Much of contemporary thinking around gender identity assumes that actually we have full and reliable access to knowing who we are. Simply by looking deep inside ourselves and observing certain patterns of, of longing, certain intuitions, and being able to determine our identity. Well, if Christianity gives us this vital insight that our, our bodies don't always work properly, it, it also adds to that insight the reality that our hearts and minds are not that reliable either. So Paul says these very stark words in, in Romans chapter 1, speaking generally of, of the whole human race. Paul says, Although they knew God, they did not honour him as God, or give thanks to him. 
but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Or again, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, again, speaking of people in general, says, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. So let me ask an awkward question. Am I saying that transgender people are all futile in their thinking, foolish in their hearts, and darkened in their minds? No. I'm saying that is true of all of us, without exception. Paul is making those comments to the human race. It is a very unflattering anthropology. But the bottom line is none of us, not a single one of us, is qualified to determine our own identity. And whatever identity we do come up with for ourselves will not be a good fit. We just don't have enough access to enough information to truly understand who we really are. And the only identity that could be a good fit would have to be an identity that comes from someone who knows us exhaustively and thoroughly. And so it is that after a Samaritan woman encountered Jesus Christ, she went back to her hometown and said, come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Her encounter with Jesus showed her certain things about Jesus, but actually what she saw about Jesus, she saw from what Jesus showed her about herself. It was his ability to put his finger on who she really was that made her ask the question, could this be the Christ? Come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So when there seems to be some kind of of tension between our perception, our mind, and our physicality, we can't just assume, well, my, my mind definitely knows who I am. And if my body doesn't feel like it fits, it must be the body that's wrong and which needs to catch up with the mind. Um, as a, a pastor, I've, I've known many people, men and women, who have struggled with severe anorexia. I think of one lady I know who at times has been dangerously thin and yet who believed herself to be grotesquely fat. And so was was simply refusing to eat. It would not have been the kindness to her to affirm how she felt about her body. Irrespective of how sincerely she felt it. There was something objective about her physicality that she was missing to significant potential harm. How we perceive ourselves and how we perceive our bodies is not always healthy, is not always accurate. It's hard to have these conversations. And it's hard to raise these issues. Our our culture seems to be in such a kind of, I was going to say such a tiz. Do you have that word in the US? Can I commend it to you? 
uh, we're in such a tiz about these issues that to stop and think about them always, almost seems a, a kind of betrayal. But think about them we must, precisely because we are talking about people. And it does not do us well simply to be told, well, no, 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 you've just got to agree with this and don't even ask questions about it. But as well as what we need to think more carefully about than perhaps our, our culture and the social media environment is encouraging us to, we also need to think through how we help. And I want to finish with a few comments on this. What can we do, whatever our particular experiences may be, or even our beliefs at this stage may be, what can we do to help? Again, I want to commend some wisdom to us from Christian scripture. Uh, the first thing we can do, all of us, is to listen well. Let me uh, share with you a proverb from the Old Testament. I suspect it's one of the most overlooked Bible verses um, in our culture today. If one gives an answer before he hears... It is his folly and shame. The hot take on Twitter, based on a snap knee-jerk reaction to what you think the other person is saying and whether you like it or not, is folly and shame. I don't care which side of the debate you happen to be on. We need to listen to people well if we're going to respond to them wisely. And people are people and not issues. We may have very strong feelings one way or another about certain issues, but that is never a justification for not taking the time and care to listen to a person to get a sense of who someone is, where they've come from, what have been the, the, the things that they've gone through. Only when we do that will we begin to be in a position to know how to be a, an encouragement and a help to someone. So we can listen well. Secondly, we can avoid unhelpful gender stereotypes. Um, whether we're believers or, or not, many of our ideas about what makes a man manly or a woman womanly are arbitrary. And for those of us who are Christians, again, often our kind of instinctive sense of what we think a man should be like and what we think a woman should be like owe far more to our culture and often to a previous generation's culture than to what the Bible actually teaches. So a question I've, I've been asking people recently, just, just as to kind of gain a bit of a survey, both here and back home in the UK, is when you have a, a men's event at church, what, what is it typically built around? What kind of activity? Uh, when you have a women's activity at church, what's that built around? In the UK, the typical response for men's events is... It's based around alcohol and spicy food. <laughs> Specifically beer and curry. Uh, women's events tend to be based around things like craft. Uh, we have an event back in my home church every year, a women's event in the run-up to Christmas on how to make a Christmas wreath. It's a good thing to, to make Christmas wreaths. There's a, nothing wrong with doing that. But it's interesting. We just, uh, we're just assuming and we're giving out a signal. If you are a man, this, a man, this is the kind of thing you are expected to be into and interested in, in our church. And if you're a woman, this is what we expect you to be about and to be interested in. And many of those things are, are somewhat arbitrary. 
So let me just share a couple of quick things on this um, from a, a, a Christian perspective. The vast majority of what the Bible says, it says to men and women without distinction, so we mustn't overdo the differences. Men are not from Mars and women are not from Venus. We are not entirely different species of human being. However, the fact that some things in the Bible are addressed specifically to men and some things specifically to women means that our differences are not just biological. And it's one of those areas where I think when it comes to, to, to men and women, we, we want to say as Christians as much as the Bible says and not a single thing more. And I think one of the mistakes the church has often made is to say far more about what it means to be a man or a woman than the Bible actually teaches. Uh, the same is true, actually, in the secular world. Uh, one of the areas of, of most sensitivity in this particular issue is, is how to respond to children who might be identifying as something other than their, their own kind of biological sex would suggest. And again, I want to suggest oftentimes we are, we are basing our view of maleness and femaleness on things that are very culturally arbitrary. You can be a real boy and you can be a real girl without conforming to certain narrow stereotypes that the Bible never ever taught. I think of one dear friend of mine who told me once that growing up in, in his church, one of the things he, he literally dreaded every year was the annual church picnic. Because everyone would sit down, they would sit on the grass, have their picnic lunch, and then the same thing would happen every year. The, the men would go off and play I think it was softball or something, and the women would kind of sit down and, and chat. And he hated sport, just had no aptitude for it and no interest in it. So he would kind of feel like, well, I can't go and do that because I just won't do it right. So I'll, I'll sit here and, and talk with the others, and they would constantly be saying, why are, you, why are you sitting here talking to us? You should be over there. Because that church had got into its head <laughs> that this is what men do and this is what women do. But the Bible gives us a much broader range of what it looks like to be a man and what it looks like to be a woman than our culture does and very often than our churches do. David was the surprise choice as king of Israel precisely because he didn't look like the kind of person you imagined the king to be. He didn't come from central casting. They didn't even put him on the shortlist because they just assumed, well, David, not David, whatever you've got in mind of a king is not him. As David is introduced to us in the, in the book of 1 Samuel, we're, we're told literally that he was beautiful, and the Hebrew word is a word used only ever to describe women. In contemporary language, David was a pretty boy. And he was someone who spent an inordinate amount of time playing a harp and writing poems about his feelings. They're called the Psalms. They're great. <laughs> and my fear is that many people would look at David today and say, David must have gender dysphoria. Or you think of some of the feisty women in the Old Testament. And again, many people would have looked at them today if they were growing up in our contemporary culture and said, well, probably some gender identity issues going on there. So we mustn't deal in unhelpful gender stereotypes. But as I close, let me say, we need to recognize where real hope is found. We tend to think, and our culture encourages us to think, that any problem we have with our body is ultimately going to be served, uh, solved by our bodies. 
And so if I'm feeling out of place in my own flesh, well, the obvious answer is I need to change my flesh and then that will fix things. If I just get the body I want, that will make everything fine. But friends, if you are looking for your body to fulfill you, you are heading for disappointment. Uh, One of the unspoken tragedies of the transgender uh, kind of issues facing us is the amount of pain and regret experienced by people after they've gone through some kind of transition surgery. The rates of deep regret are high. If you've gone through some kind of transition surgery, you are 19 times more likely to commit suicide than than the average population. And I suspect the part of the reason for that is because if we if we spend years thinking I'm in the wrong body. That is what is most fundamentally wrong with me. If I can only go through this transition, that will be what makes me feel like I really am me. That will be what will give me a sense of of inner freedom, inner wholeness, inner completion. That will finally help me to feel like I'm okay. I will finally be the real me. And you go through that process which is highly invasive, And it doesn't make you feel fully okay. You will not be going back to square one. You will be somewhere far worse because now you won't have hope. There is a body that will finally and fully give us freedom. But it's not our own. Paul writes these words to the church in Colossae. He says, God has now reconciled you in Christ's body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Holy and blameless and above reproach is another way of saying complete, authentic, real, whole, at peace, fulfilled, content, happy, fixed. And it comes about by the brokenness of Jesus' body. And the only hope for our brokenness and our own bodies is the ultimate brokenness of his body. He knew what it was like for his body to cause him enormous pain. He knew what it was like, if, you, if I can put it this way, to have body image issues because we're told in Isaiah 53 that people turned their faces away from him. People couldn't bear to look at him. His body image issues weren't in his head. They were real. The kind of people who are normally, do you call them rubberneckers here? When there's an accident on the interstate who will slow down to have a really good look. There was something about Jesus on the cross that was so appalling, people would actually look the other way. It was more than they could cope with. And there was no greater dysphoria than when he who knew no sin became sin for us. That is the ultimate experience of being in the wrong flesh. And yet as he took that on himself for us, he opened up the prospect, not just that we could be freed from our bodies, but that we could be free in our bodies. That our bodies might be redeemed and made whole through his body being broken on our behalf. Thank you for listening so patiently.
We hope you've all been enjoying the evening so far. I'm Alicia Wood, a speaker here with RZIM. And while the in-house attendees take a short break before our time of Q&A, I wanted to take a minute to share a few things with you all. First, remember, you have just a few more minutes left to submit your questions to Pigeonhole by going to pigeonhole.at and using the password trending. Now, if you're a junior or senior in high school or a college freshman, then we hope you'll join us this summer at our annual Refresh Ready for College conference. This year, we will be addressing the question that Jesus himself once asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? This was the most important question that the disciples had to answer. And our response to the same question remains just as critical for our own lives. Truth, justice, morality, sexuality, freedom, meaning, love, identity, everything that we care about, everything that we live for, all of these are grounded by the answer to that one question. To know Jesus is to know ourselves. Only when we are confident of who he is can we be sure of who we are and what he has called us to do. Don't miss this exciting conference, June 18 to the 21st, 2019 at the Zacharias Institute here in Alpharetta, Georgia. Find more information online at rzim.org forward slash events. Well, Sam Albury has just shared an amazing talk. And if you'd like to continue discussing this topic, then we would love for you to join our online community called RZIM Connect. If you aren't sure what that is, we have a short one minute video to help you become familiar. When it finishes, we will have the opportunity to speak with RZIM Connect's innovator, Carson Whitenauer. RZIM Connect is the online home for the global RZIM family. It's a place where you can interact with people around the world, enjoy great conversations, and grow in your faith. RZIM Connect is more than a message board. We have over 30 members of our team committed to answering your questions for a week at a time throughout the year. Ask any question from anywhere. No matter where you are, RZIM Connect can go with you. We're bringing our team to you through RZIM Connect. There is no cost for RZIM Connect. It is completely free. Building this community is our gift to you. Signing up is easy and should take less than a minute. Go to rzimconnect.org today. Sign up and introduce yourself. That's rzimconnect.org. We'll see you soon. Wow, how exciting. We are here with Carson Whitenauer, the innovator of RZM Connect, to break down what RZM Connect is and how you can interact with RZIM speakers and Christians around the world. So Carson, welcome. Alicia, thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> to everyone in the live stream, thank you for uh, this chance to speak to you about RZM Connect. Uh, so what's so exciting about RZM Connect is our hope is that it would be better than Google. That's our aspiration. Hmm. Because when you go to Google with a faith or life question, you get this popular, impersonal answer. Mm -hmm. But if you bring that same question to RZIM Connect, you're gonna get a personal, credible answer. I think it's likely that people are gonna pray for you. You're gonna catch this attitude and culture of respect and kindness and neighborliness and care. And we just think that that's a better environment for engaging with these real questions of the mm -hmm. heart. And I think it's the personal touch that really sets RZIM Connect apart from all the other resources out there. And that comes through in the testimonies. People will share in the community how much it's helping them. They'll say, this discussion was so much more than what I was hoping for. Or, I'm so glad to have this safe place yeah. to um, ask the deep questions of our hearts. Um, or this community has really helped me articulate my faith in a much better way to my friends. Mm -hmm. And that's really what stands out to me about RZM Connect. Well, it sounds very unique. And from what I hear, nearly 10,000 people a month actually are engaged with RZM Connect, which is pretty incredible when you hear so often that from social media, like that, that social media is toxic and it's harmful and it's not good for us. But yet we see with RZM Connect that it's an alternative, a place where people can go on a wide range of topics and just feel free to uh, share ideas and get information from other people, which is wonderful. So in addition to the conversations that members have, what else does RZM Connect have to offer? 
Yeah, I'm really encouraged by the ways people are growing through yeah. the community and just coming to maturity and faith. I think part of it's the convenience. There are mobile apps for the iPhone and the Android platforms. Okay. And so you can just download the RZM Connect app from the stores and get that on your phone. And then, um, as you know, the speakers are available in RZM Connect. So Alicia was on there two weeks ago. She did a phenomenal job answering questions. Uh, Abdu Murray, our North American director, was on the hot seat this week fielding questions. And then next week we have Neil from our India team engaging with the community. And that's really special, the, the convenient access to our speaking team. I love yeah. connecting our community with speakers like you. Oh, uh, <laughs> and then, um, and she didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, another great thing about it is our premium content. Uh, so the Church Leaders Conference is coming up. It's a two-day conference. We've got Ravi. Mm -hmm. We've got Francis Chan. And maybe coming to Atlanta uh, is too much for you. But mm -hmm. you can stream that whole conference for 30 bucks, And it's available in RCM Connect. It's very easy to purchase. And I just think the convenience of the community is why so many are coming yeah. and growing in their faith. Awesome. Well, great. Well, thank you, Carson. Clearly, this is a really helpful overview of RZM Connect. And so as we transition to the RZM Academy, I want to put an idea out there to anyone who is listening. If you lead a church or a campus ministry or even a Sunday school class or a Bible study, I recommend you make a habit of regularly recommending RZM Connect. There are only so many questions that we can address in any one talk or any given Sunday. But if you get your congregation or the students in your ministry involved in RZM Connect, then they're going to be able to mature in their faith throughout the week. And that is going to strengthen the work that you are doing in your own community. So just go to rzimconnect.org on your phone or on your computer, and you can easily sign up for a free account. Thank you for sharing with us, Carson, and hope that we see all of you there. Now, let's find out about another RZIM initiative called the RZIM Online Academy. The RZIM Online Academy is our online training program in apologetics. So we're going to play a short one-minute video and then have a conversation with Drew McNeil, our RZIM Academy's director. RZIM Academy is RZIM's online learning platform. And the brilliant thing about it is that the Academy allows people to learn from our amazing team of global speakers in the parameters of their own lives and jobs and families and responsibilities. The focus of the Academy is very practical. It comes down to having one conversation at a time, learning to ask good questions, learning to really listen to the people around us as we have conversations in our own life. It brings together people from all around the world. Students have the opportunity to learn from fellow Christians from different countries and different backgrounds and different cultures as they all come together around the content in a learning community that really encourages good conversation. For more information and to register for the next course, go to rzimacademy.org. Well, Drew, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really grateful to have you here. Uh, is it true that actually there's nearly 10,000 people from 127 different countries that have already taken the RZM Online Academy course since it began in 2014? Like, That's wow. Right. <laughs> so what is it that makes this academy so unique? Uh, I think the obvious answer is our team. So yeah. the content for the RZM Academy courses come from the RZM speaking team. So we have lectures from Ravi, from Michael Ramsden, from Sam Alberry, from Alicia Wood, from <laughs> Vince Vitale, Joe Vitale, Oz Guinness, John Lennox, Naomi Zacharias, Amy Or Ewing. All together, around 50 different people have contributed at least one lecture to an RZIM Academy course. When we put the course together, we wanted to make sure that we were offering more than just a collection of really good content. We wanted it to be a training program. And so when we were putting it together, we decided we wanted it to be interactive and practical so that as you're engaging the content, you can ask your questions, you can find answers mm -hmm. to your questions, you can apply what you're learning and you can get feedback on what you're learning. And so you mentioned that we've had students from 127 different countries <laughs> enroll so far. That means each month when we start a new group of students, the learning community that will be uh, engaging with you for the full time that you're in the course probably represents at least 15 different countries. It's a really rich environment that's created as you've got students from different cultural backgrounds, different experiences. We also have different uh, ages. So we've had teenagers and people in their 80s go through our courses. We've had pastors, we've had brand new Christians. 
people brand new to apologetics, uh, academics. So it's such a rich learning environment that I think makes the, the academy yeah. really unique. Yeah. The other thing I would say is just that we've tried to be really true to who RZIM is. If yeah. you followed RZIM, if you followed Ravi for very long, you know that as we help the thinker believe, help the believer think, um, engage, try to bridge the head to the heart, the focus is never just on the questions, it's on the questioner. Mm -hmm. So the challenge that we present to our students is to, to help them not just be better prepared for for questions, for arguments, for ideas, but are you focused on the individual in front of you? We want to train individuals to be better prepared to respond to the people around them who have sincere questions, honest objections about the Christian worldview, to better articulate uh, what it is that we believe and why yeah. we believe it, and ultimately to be more effective at pointing people to Christ. And so based on the feedback we've gotten, that's our aim, and it seems like our approach has been very effective. So great. So people sign up and they take the initial 12-week core module. That's right. But when they finish that, then what happens? Well, so one of the things that I think makes the content itself really unique are our elective courses. Okay. So to go and find uh, a, a course or training on these topics that are as in-depth uh, as what we offer in our electives, I think is, is a lot harder than what you could find on maybe a basic overview of apologetics. And so if you want to take an elective on Islam, on the reliability of scripture, on basic doctrine, uh, of course called Why Suffering, of course called Engaging the Modern World, our newest one is What Does It Mean to Be Human? And then the other one, our seventh course is um, on the intersection between faith and belief in God. We're creating new courses all the time. We're expanding into new languages. You can take our courses in Spanish, French, German, and it's coming soon, Italian and Turkish. Nice. <laughs> um, so those are good next steps where you can find content that you won't find anywhere else. And real quickly, where can they go? What's the website they can go to? The website is rzamacademy.org. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time, Drew. Really appreciate it. Now let's go ahead, before we go back to the auditorium, we want to actually just let you know of a few other initiatives that we have coming up in the next few months here at the Zacharias Institute. Number one is the Church Leaders Conference. Uh, the Church Leaders Conference is being held May 23rd and 24th. Uh, we will have a variety of speakers, including Francis Chan, Robbie Zacharias, Michael Ramsden, and others, uh, as they examine what it looks like for the church to be reconciled to God to forgive one another as the Lord forgave, and to live out our message of reconciliation in a deeply divided culture. You can find out more about this conference or others on our website at rzam.org. Additionally, we wanna let you know that we have other trending questions coming up soon and would love for you to be a part of some of the future trending questions. Trendy Questions is a series held at the Zacharias Institute where several times a year we bring you these live stream uh, events uh, with a variety of different speakers for an evening engaging with one of the most urgent questions facing our culture. Upcoming questions include, is Christianity a white man's religion? Am I just my brain? Is suicide an option? What does Christianity have to say to me? and hashtag me too generation. So please keep your eyes open and check out the RZM website and look up what, what are the future events happening in regards to trending questions and at the Zacharias Institute. Finally, let me tell you about one other aspect of this ministry. Wellspring International, our humanitarian arm. Through your prayers and support, we are able to help organizations overseas that assist women and children in need from an orphanage in Africa to housing and jobs for women caught in the sex slavery. Wellspring is at work showing God's love to a hurting world. If you wanna learn more about Wellspring, please go to our website and check out some of the different uh, places that we reach out to, and you can hopefully read a little bit more about what we are doing with the Wellspring ministry. Now, let's go ahead and move back over to the auditorium for a question and answer time with Sam Alberry. Like, oh man. <laughs> it was like I mean, he's like talking to me.
Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for all of you who are on time. We'll we'll get those doors closed and get the sound get the sound down in here. Thank you guys for coming back online. Hopefully you guys had a good break, got your popcorn popped, and ready for a time of Q and A. Um, Sam, thank you for um, the talk. As we received a lot of questions um, online, and I'm, we just have organized these here. Um, and just so you guys know, we're going, to, we're going to be handling some of the top questions, but there's also a variety of questions in there that we've um, selected out as well. So it's not necessarily everything at the top and down. We are um, trying to give a variety of responses here that we feel would be uh, give you the most full content and be most helpful. So there was um, something you were, you were talking about in there in, your, um, in our interview, and I think people, you didn't implicitly say this, but I'm Wondering if you could answer this question here, the first one. Um, is same-sex attraction in and of itself sinful? I think this is a common question that comes up. If you could address that, that'd be great. Thank you. So glad that you are able to engage with these topics. Thank you for submitting questions. And um, I say that having seen some of the questions, and they're hard. So I, I, I say thank you through gritted teeth um, with some of those. <laughs> Uh, that, that first question is very, very significant, and it, it's, not, it's, it's sort of on topic for, for this evening, but certainly, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, talking about same-sex attraction being part of my own journey, what I was meaning by that was, um, as a teenager, I became increasingly aware of romantic and sexual feelings towards other men, uh, became a Christian then when I turned 18, and so then a significant part of my discipleship was what does it mean to bring those experiences under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And obviously a, a key part of that is, is honouring the teaching of Jesus about the, the godly and appropriate place for sex being within the covenant of a, of a marriage between a man and a woman. So I, I knew I would have to, to, um, to say no to those desires in order to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Um, is same-sex attraction a sin, sounds like it, it, it only requires a monosyllable to answer it, and I hate answers that always begin with, well, Webster's defines, but we, we need to be very clear on what we mean by attraction. Um, some people use the word attraction to mean the capacity, what some people would call the orientation. Is it a sin to have the capacity to be attracted to people of the same sex? And I would say on that issue, I don't think it is a sin. Um, all of us will experience certain forms of, of temptation. Virtually all of us will experience certain forms of sexual temptation. Uh, we don't tend to choose the particular form temptation takes. What is our responsibility is how we respond to temptation. And the Bible is very clear that we need to, we need to flee sexual sin. So the Bible makes a distinction between temptation and sin. Jesus in the Lord's Prayer says, deliver me from temptation, but forgive me from, you know, forgive us for our sins. So that the experience of being tempted is not in and of itself a sin. It is, however, a reflection of the fact that we have a fallen nature, that we're even tempted in these ways is a sign that we are, we're not the way we're meant to be. Uh, that we have the capacity to be tempted, in that sense, is a sign that we're fallen. The temptation itself is not a sin. If we indulge the feeling, even only within the privacy of our own minds, that is a sin. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 5, that if someone looks with lustful intent, he's committed sexual sin in his heart. So it's not enough to say, well, I've got the feelings, but I'm not physically acting. Jesus says, actually, if we are mentally acting... That is a sin. So temptation isn't a sin, but indulging feelings and fantasies, looking with a certain intent, is a sin. So even before we've begun to physically do anything, we've already committed a sin. And by the way, that teaching of Jesus convicts every single one of us. Every single one of us is a sexual sinner. And it's the flip side of, of something good, that Jesus regards your sexual integrity as being so precious that it is not to be violated even in the privacy of someone else's mind. And theirs is so precious, it's not to be violated in the privacy of your mind. 
all of us have fallen very, very far short of that. I well, hope that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, that answers the question well. I, I appreciate that distinction uh, that you made. And I even think back to the beginning in the garden the, and that, that first temptation that was there. Mm -hmm. when, when, do we, when do we say that that fall happened? Yeah. You know, when it was actually taken and um, the sin was committed to choose to just, um, determine good and evil in our own eyes. Yeah. And eat. Um, okay, well, the, let's go, move to the second question here. Let me see if it's going to come up. I'll, it says, am I compromising my beliefs by using a transgender person's preferred pronoun? For instance, calling someone going through a male to female change, she. Thank you. That's a really serious question, isn't it? Um, I want to share with you a, a, a passage that helps me on this. Um, I've, I've had the, the, the privilege and opportunity of spending some time, not much time and not enough time, with, with transgender people. And that question becomes very, very immediate and vital when you're in an actual real-life context. It, it is no longer abstract. You've got flesh and blood in front of you. Uh, how are you going to respond to that person? Um, there's a proverb, I think, that, that helps with some of this. Um, Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5, I think, give us a principle that can apply to this kind of issue. Let me just read these proverbs to you. They're, they may make you raise an eyebrow because they, I've heard this, this, these particular verses used as evidence for why the Bible can't be trusted and why it's full of contradictions. So it's fun to, to dive in with that one, isn't it? Um, Proverbs 26, <laughs> verse 4 and 5. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Sorry, I've read the wrong verse. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Next verse, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So it's one of those Bible, do I answer a fool according to his folly, yes or no? And the Bible says yes and no. Uh, there are times when you shouldn't answer a fool according to his folly, and there are times when you should. Uh, what does answering a fool according to his folly mean? A fool in Proverbs is simply someone who is not orienting life around a creator God, the, the creator God of the Bible. So by using the word folly in the context of this discussion, I'm, I'm not implying something demeaning about transgender friends. It's just an example of people who don't have a, a Christian worldview. So... The, the proverb seems to be saying there are times when you shouldn't run with an unbiblical way of thinking. Don't indulge someone's non-biblical way of thinking in case you end up becoming like that person yourself. In other words, if you think, okay, I'm going to join in that particular um, unbiblical way of thinking, the danger is that you, you end up becoming part of it. Uh, you, you, it wins you over. But on the other hand, there are times when you, you should adopt that unbiblical framework in order to, over time, be able to show someone why that framework doesn't work and why there, there is the need for biblical wisdom. So if I can apply that to this issue, and this is why it's not a yes-no issue for me, um, if I'm, do I need to do something to stop that happening? I'll just assume you'll wave at me if I do. Um, Don't blame me. So it's got to be my... my okay, I'll blame Sean. Yeah. Sean's fault. Um, if I'm meeting someone for the first time who identifies as transgender, so someone in this situation going from, from sort of male to female and is identifying as a she and, and presenting with a, a female name, in that instance, my, my instinct as someone who is a Christian who is wanting to ultimately share Christ with someone, is I want to be hospitable. I would rather I was the one feeling uncomfortable rather than the other person. And because I'm, I'm not wanting to immediately close down the possibility of future conversation, I will probably in those instances be happy to adopt that person's name and pronoun simply because 
to start the conversation with the insistence that we're using my language and not theirs actually just means that that's going to be the end of the conversation. It's going to be the end of the encounter. I, I want to kind of make me the one who's doing the initial accommodating and hospitality because I want in time to commend a biblical view of gender identity to this particular individual. Now, the danger is that we just do that because we're conflict-averse and it feels like the easy option. Mm. That, would be a, that would be, I think, where the proverb's saying it's unwise um, because you're basically saying, I don't want to resist your worldview or I'm intimidated by the kind of cultural climate that we're in. Um, but there will be other times, and this, this may happen where someone, say, at my church who's been a Christian for many years suddenly says to me, I, I now want you to call me this instead of that and to address me by this pronoun and not that pronoun, in that instance, I'm most likely not going to. Because in that case, this is someone who does know differently. Um, ah, you, your fault was in breaking this yep. from there. Um, into the green room. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, in some sense, it does depend on who the person is and whether I think there's someone who... Has no, if they've got no background in the Christian faith, I want to give them as much. I want to be as flexible as I can be in order to be able to spend the time with them that I might be able to commend Christ. And if it's someone who is professing to be a mature Christian and is suddenly springing this on me, I think in that instance, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, but I can't agree with that. Mm. So it will, to some extent, depend on the person and where I, where I think they may be heading spiritually makes me think about relationships just in our day-to-day -day life on other topics when we're in the family and we, 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 we discuss things a little bit different. The first time we have someone over to our home, we want them to leave with the feeling that they've been, they've been treated well and respected in order to continue the, the relationship. That's and there's, there's a wisdom issue generally in life, isn't there? Which, which are going to be the battles that you, you yeah. choose to die on? Um, which you think, well, I'm going to let that go for now, but we'll pick that up at another time. Or which are going to be the ones where actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm not even going to entertain that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you on that. Um, By the way, yeah. I may be wrong on that. Yeah. that that's, that's where I'm at based on those verses in Proverbs. I'm, uh, that, that's not a chiseled in stone, definitive, ultimate answer to that question. It's where I'm at at the moment. And I'm happy to be corrected by others on that and hear their advice from others on that. It makes me think of something that um, one of our a mutual friend of ours, Craig Ellis, said to me one time. He says, I don't do Q and I do Q and I do Q and R. I can, I can guarantee you a response, but it might not be the right, it might not be the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, great. Well, thir third question here we have. How does the church graciously welcome the transgender individual while still preaching on the biblical view of sexuality? Thank you. I, I love the, the, the heart behind the question, both wanting to be... Friends, what do we need to do to, to stop that happening? I think it is you. It's, it's always you, Sean. See, I told you, blame it on me. There we go. <laughs> this is how much trouble we cause. We need four microphones. For if, it, if it continues, we're going to have to give every single one of you a handheld microphone <laughs> yeah. as well, by the way. We have, we have enough to go around. <laughs> This is good. This is giving me thinking time, so please keep doing that, that thing, Sean. Um, I love the heart behind this question, both wanting to, to not just modify and, and change the Bible's teaching, but also we want to welcome and we want to be gracious. So let me affirm the, affirm the question very much. Um, it, it's easy to be clear in our own convictions in a way that is very graceless and unwelcoming, and sometimes it's possible to seem very gracious and welcoming whilst being actually very mistaken in our convictions, in which case what we're welcoming people into is not ultimately going to do them any good. So this is the issue. How do we be people of both grace and truth? And the answer is by becoming as much like Jesus as we possibly can because Jesus was full of grace and truth. Uh, one is never played off against the other. Both come together in Jesus if we think we have one without the other, we have neither. And Jesus managed to, to be a, a friend of sinners. He managed to be someone who profoundly disagreed 
with the people that he was associating with, and yet so conducted himself that people felt genuinely welcomed and cared for by him. So we, that, could, that immediately tells us that if our convictions make us brittle, angular, harsh, and unapproachable, those convictions may seem theologically orthodox, but they're actually not. Because actually, real gospel truth will make us very, very soft-hearted towards other people. If we see someone who has a totally different worldview to our own, our posture will not be one of looking down and sneering and feeling superior. Our posture will be one of, if God can show kindness to me, there is not a person on the planet who he would not love. And so I think it, it helps us to be very, very conscious of what it is God has forgiven us. And if we really come to terms with that, it will obliterate <laughs> any sense of moral superiority, any Phariseeism, any self-righteousness. It will make us very approachable and safe people because we, we won't have that kind of condemning spirit. There will be times when we need to say things that are very hard to hear. There'll be times when we need to offer a word of correction. But we will be doing so as, as people who have sat under the gracious, kind correction of Jesus Christ himself and have seen how tender he is to us, how patient he is with us. And so the more we receive that from Christ, the more we will instinctively convey that to other people. Now, when it comes to this particular context of the biblical view on, on sexuality, I think one of the most important things, whether it's someone who is transgender or, or identifying as LGBT in some other way, um, is to remember what I, I mentioned earlier, that all of us are sexual sinners. And so my, my approach on these issues where there is so much sensitivity is don't say to someone what you can't say to everyone. So don't make someone's transgenderish, transgenderism the kind of the main starting point of, of your dealing with them, but actually show that transgenderism is but one manifestation of what is true for all of us, that we all misidentify ourselves in any number of ways. We, we, some of us it will be through the, the issue of gender identity. Some of us it will be through our perceived self-righteousness. Some of us it will be by we identify with our career or our family or our marriage or our children or whatever it might be, but all of us misidentify ourselves. So if I'm meeting someone who is, is transgender and they're wanting to, they're coming to church, praise God for that. I don't want to make their transgenderis, trans, nah, transgenderism the kind of issue that makes it sound like I'm singling them out in a way that I don't single out other people. But I want, I want to try and convey that, listen, we are all in this together. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. All of us are being called to repentance by Jesus Christ. All of us will one day face the judgment seat of Christ. And the, the gospel does level the playing field. Now, in terms of what then happens beyond the welcome stage? What if someone is coming to our church, still is, is self-identifying as, as being transgender, but is then wanting to become more involved, maybe in, in formal ways in our, our church? I know a couple of people have been asking about, well, should, should someone who's transgender be able to be kind of involved maybe in, in leadership or in, in this aspect or that aspect of, of church life? That will depend on what our normal policy is on who we allow into certain areas of service within the church. So that the condition for all of us should be the same, which is that we are professing believers, that we've had enough contact with those in the, the leadership of the church to give the sense that we are sincere in our discipleship, that we are earnestly desiring to follow Jesus, 
and that we are therefore turning away from the things that Jesus calls us to turn away from. With someone who is, is transgender, I think part of discipleship will involve learning how to, to think of our biological sex that we were given by God and to receive that as a good gift from a loving creator, even if it has been a very, very painful gift. I think that will be part of the entailment of discipleship for someone who is transgender. Learning to receive the sex that they were given by God as a good gift. I'm not expecting that to happen overnight because I know, I know what a slow and painful process change can be in my own life. I know what a slow sheep I am. So I'm calling myself a sheep now. Um, and, and all of us are, none of us are, are kind of fast-track disciples. None of us kind of have just aced this. God is having to be very patient with every single one of us. So I, I would want the transgender person to be, to be earnestly, genuinely, with a sincere heart, living as disciples as Jesus Christ. And I'm not expecting them to have all of this resolved and clear in their head and sorted out by tomorrow, because it's going to take time. Thank you for that huge challenge to be like Jesus. Um, I think we have time for a couple more. Let's um, go on to this fourth one. What if, what if God created transgender people? It says male and female, not male or female. God also has feminine attributes? Thank you. Very, very thoughtful question. Um, well, God has created everyone, so we, we can, whether whoever anyone is or however they identify, they are, they are created by God, which, which immediately tells us they are of inestimable worth. They are to be honored. They are worthy of our care and service. They will most likely, whoever they are, have a story worth listening to. They are someone worth getting to know. They will be someone who is amazing if they are created in the image of an amazing God. However, what none of us can do is simply read off from our own intuitions and feelings how we believe God has created us to be. One of the painful things that Jesus says to all of us is that how we have been born is not, is not quite right. We've all been born a bit wrong. Which means that things that feel very, very innate to us and have done maybe since we were born may not be right and may not be true. They may not be a reflection of who God has made us to be. So Jesus says that when he, he says to a man called Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again. Now, we're so familiar with the language of, of being born again, it's kind of become part of kind of standard Christian speak that we, we forget just how extraordinarily offensive that phrase is. Um, because Jesus isn't saying, add a bit of religion and spirituality to life as though it's a bit of seasoning. When Jesus says you must be born again, he's saying you didn't come out right the first time. And you don't need to try a bit better. You need to be made new and you need a new self. Now that is what Jesus says to every single one of us. So to someone who says, well... God has created me transgender. I would want very gently to, to point out, God has created every single one of us. But we can't pin on God every single instinct and preference that we, that we experience. And again, that's the case for all of us. This is, I'm not singling anyone, anyone out here. Um, Sin has distorted us, and it has disordered us. So those false identities we keep giving ourselves are not a sign of how God has created us, but they're a sign of how, how the fall has distorted our thinking. 
So this is not an issue that is unique to people who are transgender. That's just one example, again, of what is true of every single one of us. And actually, the fact that God has created us doesn't just mean God, God got the kind of flat pack from Ikea and assembled us. When we say God created us, we mean more than God kind of stuck the limbs together and, and assembled the body. We are saying God had the idea of you in the first place. He was the one who came up with the idea of you. And he was having a good day when he came up with that idea. He got a kick out of thinking up you. Now, every single one of us has some sense that we're not the person we sense we should be. That there's, there's, a, there's a version of us we, we sense we should be that we, we just can't be. And that is a reflection of the fact that God came up with the idea of us, but we don't do a very good job of being us. Which is why we need to be made new by Jesus. And the wonderful thing is, as we're made new by Jesus and as we follow Jesus, we don't become less ourselves. We become who we truly are. So Jesus says something very paradoxical and, again, very difficult for all of us, but something utterly wonderful. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus says, yourself needs to be denied. You need to say a, a deep and profound no to some of the things that are deepest within you and feel most defining of you. And yet as you deny self and follow Jesus, what actually happens is you become the you that God always had in mind. You become your real self. The self you find you, you were denying is actually your distorted self. Now, I don't know how Jesus pulls this off. I just know that he does. But if every single one of us became more like Jesus, we would not become more like each other. But we would become more like the real us, the real self. Um, I've talked for so long, I've forgotten what the question was, but I'm assuming I've answered. Oh, yeah, so male... It's very clear from the, from the Bible, by the way, going back to male and female, not male or female, that, that the, the Bible is speaking there in terms of a binary, not in terms of a blend. Um, again, that, that is very painful for, for some of us to hear where it feels as though we might be some kind of mix of male and female. That is some people's experience. And of course, for those who are intersex, there seems to be some, some biological ambiguity. But again, that doesn't override the fact that God has designed us as male and female. It simply reinforces the painful reality that our experience of that in this world is not going to be straightforward and will often be very painful. Um, God having feminine attributes, God is the creator of male and female. He's not contained by either one of those. He reveals himself to us and reveals himself to us as, as father and son and spirit. But as father, son and spirit, he, he also shows us characteristics that we typically think of as being feminine. There are times in, the, in, in scripture where God describes himself as being like a, a, being like a mother. Um, that doesn't mean God is, is gender fluid. Uh, it doesn't mean that God is ambiguous. God is above and beyond gender. He's above and beyond biological sex because he is spirit. But he still re reveals himself to us and in his inner life is Father, Son and Spirit. There's some mystery in there and um, we may not get our heads around that fully but we both want to preserve the ways in which God has identified himself whilst recognizing that his attributes are, are far wider than what we tend to typically associate with someone with people who are fathers and sons does that make sense so there's, there's an irony here. Um, I don't mean to sound flippant in saying this, but there is an irony that some of the people who are most insisting on everybody's right to be called by their chosen pronoun are not extending that to God. Wow. 
thanks. A lot to think about there. <laughs> All right, we have five minutes. Um, this will be the last question of the night, but feel free, as this is the last question, if there's anything you'd like to add on that you wish that you could have said more on, uh, feel free to close out with any, any closing comments you have on this. But the, the last question that we want to close with is, how should we voice our opinions on the same sex on same-sex marriage or transgender issues without seeming hateful or intolerant? Thank you. That's, um, that's a very understandable question, isn't it? Because we, we're very conscious, if we're, if we're Christians, of how easy it, it is to be labeled um, hateful or in, intolerant today. Um, I guess I want to say two things to this. The first thing is, is make every effort to give someone no actual reason to think you really are hateful or intolerant. So again, we, we need to, to follow the example of Jesus here. Jesus was clearly not hateful and intolerant in the way he interacted with people that he called sinners. And so if we are to be Christ-like, as people who are aware of our own sin, again, we, we need to be that that wonderfully... Christ-like combination of uncompromising in the truth that God has shown us and the type of person that feels most safe, most caring, most kind, most compassionate, most empathetic and most loving to people around us with whom we may have some very, very profound and even offensive disagreements. So we need to, to pray hard that we would be filled with the Spirit of Jesus. Uh, we need to check our own hearts to see where there are times when we are being hateful. And we all have our, our pet irritations. We all have the types of sins out there that we really just don't like. And it's very easy to justify that dislike and think, well, I'm just being righteously indignant, when actually what we might be being is morally superior prigs. Um, so let's take our cue from Paul, who in 1 Timothy called himself the worst of all sinners. Like if the guy who wrote half the New Testament can call himself the worst of all sinners, I think we can probably do something healthy by regarding ourselves in the same kind of light. If we're always amazed that God loved me and can never quite get over that, I think we will be the kind of people that it is very hard to say as a hateful or, or intolerant. That said, Jesus himself was violently opposed. And it may well be that even if we are supernaturally Christ-like, that is no guarantee that we won't be called hateful and intolerant. But the danger is that we, the, the danger is that we, we get called hateful and intolerant and say, well, that's obviously because I'm a Christian and I'm being persecuted for being a Christian, when actually we're just a jerk. So we need to make every effort to be as, as Christ-like as we, as we can. We're not looking for opposition. We're not looking to be attacked in that kind of way. And to make sure that if we are labelled in those kinds of ways, we need to be able to have a clear conscience that we've not actually warranted that kind of that kind of attack. Thank you. Can we give Sam a hand? Well, as we close out tonight, I just want to say uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you guys for tuning in on live stream. And I, as we go around to universities, one of the things I find very common is people reject Christianity or reject God based on a misconception. They reject something that Christianity actually doesn't claim to be. This is why we want to do some of these events where we're, we're engaging with some of these questions and clarifying some common misunderstandings. So we hope this has been helpful for you tonight. Sam, thank you for bringing such a great challenge and um, not only just in the content, but in the tone and modeling that for us. So I'm just so thankful for you, brother. And um, if you guys wanna 
check out other, all the other events that will be coming up. We have more trending questions. I mentioned the one with Ravi will be coming up. And I also, um, there's, we're going to be doing this Christianity, white man's religion, um, responding to questions of suicide. Am I just my brain? Is suicide an option? What does Christianity have to say to the Me Too generation? In May, Francis Chan, Ravi Zacharias, Michael Ramsden, a lot of our team are going to be here for a uh, church leaders conference. And then in June, we have Refresh, which is our four-day juniors and seniors in high school, uh, freshmen in college. It's a four-day conference. So if you know people who'd want to come to that, Sam will be with us there as well. So look forward to seeing you again. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you to the live stream. I'm going to say goodbye now. Um, and for those of us here, we can, if you have a book, you can head on up to the bookstore. Sam is going to be signing books there. If you have any questions that you want to talk about extensively, feel free to uh, find me. I'll be up there. Alicia Wood will be up there, another one of our speakers. Feel free to come talk to us as well, as Sam is going to be um, signing a lot of books. So thank you guys for coming, and hope you have a great evening.